Friends, welcome back to my kitchen. It's been a busy morning around here already. Let me take you back and show you what we did this morning. I did all that and then I had to run, do some errands, and I just got home. Friends, this was a busy morning. The first thing we're gonna do is by start by cooking some chickens. I wanted to get up and I wanted to get a few things checked off the list before I got ready and had to run the errands I needed to run. So in my roaster pan, I started by lining the roaster pan with a couple onions that had sprouted. They're still good, but they definitely need to be used up, so this is a good way to do it. These are pasture-raised chickens that I bought from Azure Standard when they were on sale, and I'm glad I did because now they have gone up way in price. So I'm seasoning them pretty liberally with some seasoned salt. Then I'm going to add a little bit of water to the bottom of this roaster pan. I'm going to turn it on about 350 degrees, and I'm going to let it cook for about two hours because these chickens are frozen. And here we are going to start by making three pie crusts. I normally make my pie crust in the food processor, but part of my food processor is broken and I finally figured out where to order those pieces so they are on their way. And we are gonna make a rhubarb pie today. The rhubarb is in from the garden. And so I wanna go ahead and make an extra crust to make a quiche for breakfast as well. So we might as well do two things at one time. I do like to try to keep the butter pretty big and chunky when I'm making pie crust. That leads to a really, really flaky crust that is just absolutely delicious. One of the keys to a flaky pie crust is to try to add as little bit of water as possible. A lot of times I will use vodka when I make my pie crust, but I just did not feel like getting out another ingredient today. And I am going to divide this in three because we made a three crust recipe today. And when I am working on getting these into balls, I don't knead it, but I do push the dough together and it helps if you use a little bit of saran wrap and that just helps get it into a nice ball. Another thing we're gonna do today is we are gonna be making some peach pit jelly. I've never done this before, but when I canned my peaches this year, I knew I wanted to try to do this. So what I did is when I was done canning my peaches, I saved all the peels and pits. I put them in a bag and they've been in my freezer. So the thing today is getting things out of the freezer. Now we're going to make the juice to make the jelly. So I'm just going to add the pits and peels to a pot and fill it with water and we're going to let this simmer all morning long. And here it is. And I was a little worried about this being a little watery, but I've seen this recipe all over online. And I thought that this year would be a good year to try it because normally I just compost the peels and pits. Now that I have two things cooking away, I'm going to focus on getting the quiche done. In this bowl, I have some pre-cooked sausage. I love keeping pre-cooked sausage and bacon in my freezer just to make life a lot easier. I added eggs, some half and half pepper, salt, homegrown parsley. This is some garlic powder. This is the last of the store-bought garlic powder. And then I do have quite a bit of freeze-dried whole garlic that we're going to be turning into powder. These are greens from the garden. There's all different types of greens in here. I have not been very good about using it. So I'm really working on using it so that we can use it up before I start preserving this year's greens. And I have some zucchini here that was frozen. I strained out any of the extra liquid and we're going to add that to this quiche as well. We have some sharp cheddar cheese and the last ingredient and my favorite ingredient are some caramelized onions. This recipe is based on my caramelized onion quiche recipe, but I added the greens and the zucchini to it just to add a little bit of extra nutrients and use up last year's garden's produce. I have rhubarb in a couple different areas of the property and before we get too deep into the kitchen stuff, I think it's good to go out and go ahead and harvest some rhubarb for today's projects. I really wanted to spend the day outside today, but I just knew the weather wasn't gonna really allow it but I knew that I would have the ability to go out and harvest rhubarb so that we could make a delicious rhubarb pie for my mother-in-law. This is the previous owner's garden area and it is a disaster. So this is gonna be a project coming up pretty soon where I need to clean this area up. There is a ton of rhubarb that's growing in here and I'm gonna harvest enough for at least one pie. This is kind of a tradition where I make rhubarb pie for my mother-in-law every year. I, I don't know if it's happened every year, but it sure happens a lot. And this is one of my absolute favorite desserts. 
I've been harvesting from this rhubarb patch for this is the third spring now and I every year take the leaves that are huge and I use them as mulch and I just mulch them around the rhubarb bed and they break down just fantastically and that is what I do every year. So here is our rhubarb that I collected. We're going to need to go inside and wash it but this is going to make a delicious dessert. It's time to roll out the crust and for the crust I let it sit in the refrigerator while we made the filling just to chill down that butter again I try to use as little flour as possible and did you see how those big pieces of butter you could still see the butter pieces that's what you want when you're making crust because those butter pieces are going to allow this crust to be really really flaky and I made way more filling than if this pan can hold so what I'm going to do with this crust is when I fold over the dough I'm not going to cut that off I'm going to use that to build up this pan so that I don't have an explosion of quiche or I don't have to waste the excess quiche that I, filling that I made so once I fold it over I'll put a pretty fluted edge on it and then we will fill it up I'm excited about this quiche because I haven't made it in a long time because I was making a lot of it and then I got sick of it. So I put it in a 400 degree oven and I will eventually put a little bit of foil on it just so that the top doesn't burn before it's done because that's definitely a deep dish quiche. Last thing we're going to get done before we head on our errands and come back to finish this very, very busy day is it's spa day for Orbit in Tibro. Once I get ready for the day, I run my errands. We're going to come back and we've got a lot of canning we're going to do. So stay tuned and it's going to be a fun afternoon. And now we're about to pick up where we left off and we've got a lot of stuff to do. When I was gone, Josh took the quiche out. So we're going to cut some of this and have some breakfast slash lunch. It's already two o'clock. So it's had some time to sit and cool, which is perfect. And the bottom crust is nice and browned and crispy. No soggy bottoms around here. That is fantastic. I just took a bite. Now we've got some stuff we got to get going on. I have my peach juice here and that's ready to be strained. Our chicken needs to be taken out of here. It is done. And then we're going to start making some stock. You know it's done because the bones are just falling off. So we're going to get the chicken in here to cool so we can separate the chicken from the bones. I did get out some pumpkin because I'm gonna make pumpkin pasta for dinner tonight. And then I have some zucchini. We may get to some zucchini muffins. I have that thought. We're gonna can a ton of meat. We still need to make a rhubarb pie. I hope this works out because we're doing a lot of canning projects I've never done before. Let's just get right into it. We've got a lot more to do. So first thing we're gonna do is manage this chicken. We already have a good amount of broth in here, which is great because we need that when canning the ground beef and the sausage. I've never canned meat before, so this is gonna be a really fun experiment. I'm excited about it. You can tell these chickens are done because the chickens are falling apart as we take them out. While this chicken is cooling, I'm gonna get some veggie scraps in our pot. I'm gonna fill this with water. I also have some freeze-dried celery I'm gonna put in there. This chicken is still very hot, but I'm going to go through and just pull out the bones that are easy to get off and the skin. The skin's going to add a lot of flavor to our broth. I want to get this broth going as quickly as possible because we need to use this broth to can the ground beef and the sausage. So you can use to can ground beef or sausage, any ground meat, water or stock. And so I want to get this going so it's going to have a little bit more flavor than just water. But I don't need it to be bone broth quality or stock quality that I would want to can just by itself. The stock, the chicken stock, probably is going to end up taking overnight. So I probably won't end up canning the actual chicken broth until tomorrow, which is totally fine. This is the peaches, the pits, and the peels. I want to get this juice straining. This has been boiling for almost six hours now, just on a gentle simmer, I should say. I've never canned jelly before, so this is an experiment to me as well. And I've never canned anything other than peach salsa and peaches. Never done like a peach jam or anything, so I'm excited to give this a try. 
if I can't get this to set because like I said I've never done this before then what we'll have is peach syrup which I think will be just as good Josh and I both love the flavor of peaches and so putting peach syrup on a Dutch baby or a waffle or we don't even have a waffle maker so I don't know why I said that a like French toast or something I think that would be really good the chickens are gonna love these scraps too I'm trying to be as efficient as possible in thinking through what tasks should be done in what order so that we can get as much done as possible because we have a lot of projects today. So now that we have our broth going, I want to get our jam going and we're going to water bath can this. So for one recipe, it needs four and a half cups of juice. So I think I have enough to do two recipes here. I have enough juice to make three batches. So I have three bags of pectin I'm going to put in a separate bowl. Now I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of our pre-measured sugar. That's the sugar we need to make all the jam jelly. And we're going to stir the pectin and sugar together. And then we're going to stir this into our juice. And we're going to have this come up to a rolling boil. Once this is at a rolling boil just means that you can't stir away the bubbles. We'll add the rest of the sugar. This is going to take a couple minutes to get to that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a water bath canner going here. I'm going to get my jars going. And then if I have time, I'll start working on taking the meat off those bones on the chicken. From what I understand, because this is the first time I'm really canning chicken, is when you cook your chicken the first time, you don't really need to cook it till it's completely cooked because when we can it, we're going to be cooking it again. I just cooked these until I knew they were cooked all the way through. I didn't clean up my mess from rolling out the crust for the quiche this morning because as soon as we have the canners running, then we're going to get going on the rhubarb pie because we can have the rhubarb pie cooking while we're in the kitchen watching our canners. This is a beautiful rolling boil. We lost our one spoon there. Oh goodness. That's going to be a sticky mess, but that's okay. Let's get that cleaned up first thing. Now what we're going to do is add all of our sugar. This had the juice in it, so it was kind of sticking to it. So let's get all that sugar out. We need this to come back up to a rolling boil. When you're making jams and jellies, you can't mess with the sugar, pectin, fruit ratio. You need to follow the directions on the package, and that's what's going to help ensure your jelly or jam sets and doesn't turn into a syrup. So we're gonna have this come back to a rolling boil. That sugar dropped the temperature of the juice. And once it comes back up to a rolling boil, we're gonna boil it for one minute. And then we get to get it in our jars and get in our canner. So a little bit of water got under here, but we're gonna use our pressure canner as a water bath canner because we're gonna be putting hot jelly in jars and we want our water to be hot too. You run the risk of breaking jars when the contents of the jar and the water you're putting those jars in are not the same temperature. In the time it took to wait for that jam to come to the first boil, we got all the meat picked off the bones. I tried to get, keep the pieces a little bit bigger so they don't just turn into shreds. Our broth is now ready to go and I have our jars set up and ready to go for the peach jam. Excuse me, peach jelly. This is the first time I'm making jelly, so I'm not used to saying that. I'm still waiting for my jelly, so I'm gonna start packing these pint jars with our chicken. I mixed up the dark and light meat so that each jar will have a little bit of each. And you're not supposed to stuff them down. From what I understand, you're supposed to just kinda like gently pack them in, and you're supposed to leave about one inch of head space. I mostly want to do pints because they say that's about a pound of chicken, but I might run out of pints, so I might have to do a couple quarts. All right, we're at a rolling boil. We had a little bit of a spill again. That's okay, I'm gonna clean that up in just a minute. We're gonna have this boil for one minute. Friends, I wish you could smell this. It smells incredible. We're gonna put it in our jars. I have half pint and one and a half pint jars and we're going to leave a quarter inch of head space. I like to use a canning funnel. You don't have to, but it makes cleanup a lot easier. I don't know for certain, but I think this set because it's already thickening up 
And I did not sterilize these jars. You do not have to sterilize canning jars according to the recommendations and guidelines. You need to make sure they're very, very clean. They get sterilized in the actual canning process. So my favorite thing to do, if I know I'm gonna be doing a big canning day like we're doing today, then I run my dishwasher just full of canning jars. And that's exactly what I did. These were already washed one time after they're used, they're washed. But before I can, I like to wash them one more time. And that just ensures that I have really, really clean jars that we're working with. I was a little bit worried when I started this process that it was gonna be not very peach flavor forward because we just used those skins and pits. Now, there was quite a bit of flesh as well because if I couldn't get the flesh off the pits, I knew I was gonna do this project, so I just left the peach flesh on them. But I have tasted this and it tastes phenomenal. It tastes very, very peach forward. So my worries were for not. There's a little bit of a skin that kind of formed on the top here. So I'm gonna scrape that off and discard that. I don't think that would hurt anything, but just to have a prettier product, I need a spoon or I could just do this. I like to can my jellies and jams in smaller jars so that they make a really nice gift. And if I wanna gift people some, instead of giving them a big pint, I can gift them a few little ones and then I can give them different jams and they can have a bunch of samplers. Most of the jams and jellies I make end up at other people's houses. Today on every canning project, we're gonna wipe the rims of every jar. We're gonna feel around to make sure there's no nicks or dings on the rim of each jar. We want to do this so that we get a very good seal. You don't want to go through all this effort, leave some debris or food on the rim and not get a good seal because of that. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to put a new canning lid on each one of these jars. These are my new absolute favorite canning lids. They are more affordable. The company is called Four Jars. I can leave a link down in the description box with a discount code. One of my friends told me about these canning lids who is an avid canner, and I probably will never go back to buying Ball or Kerr canning lids again because these are way more affordable and the quality is much better. They're a lot thicker, and I haven't had one lid failure since I've started using these, so I'm pretty impressed. And then each one gets a ring. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. We got all of those jars to fit in there. We're going to have this come to a rolling boil again. That's a theme. And we are going to start our timer once it starts boiling for 10 minutes. The next thing we're going to get going is we are going to get some ground beef cooking. When you can ground beef or any ground meat, sausage or anything, you cannot raw pack it. It has to be cooked first. We are going to cook a little bit of beef, stew beef, that we're not going to cook. It's going to be a raw pack method. But I want to try canning some ground beef because for two reasons. One, I think the convenience of it having on my pantry shelves is going to be incredible. I've seen so many people um, over the years do this and my mother-in-law just did it and she loves it. And the second reason why I want to have this done is because I need to get some things out of my freezer. I need to start making room for things in my freezer. So that's why I'm doing this. Just the convenience of having cooked ground beef on my pantry shelf where I could throw together a really quick spaghetti, I could throw together tacos, and I don't have to go through the effort of thawing beef. My beef in my house is always frozen because I buy half a cow or I buy it from butcher box. So by doing this, I can have non-frozen beef at my convenience at any time. I'm cooking this in my roaster pan on my stove because I wanna get all of this cooked quickly and it's the biggest pan I have. I have some stew beef here. This is grass-fed, grass-finished beef from Butcher Box. And I'm gonna do the raw pack method with this. You don't have to put any liquid or anything. So we're gonna fill it. You're not supposed to push it down. You're just supposed to gently fill the jar. And on this, we're gonna leave one inch head space as well. One of the main reasons I want to try this is 
I love making stroganoff with shredded beef. And typically the way I make my stroganoff with shredded beef is I take a roast, I cook roast and we have that for dinner. And then I take the leftovers and turn that into stroganoff. By doing this, I could just open this jar and I could make stroganoff really quickly. Or I could season it for fajitas or taco meat or something and have shredded beef instead of ground beef. So I season them with salt and this is all you have to do. I think raw packing will be my favorite method moving forward, but ground beef you have to cook and I have so many whole chickens in my freezer, I'm not gonna debone them and raw pack them that way. The easiest way to do this is just to cook the chicken first, pack it, cooked, and then can it. So I'm just gonna stick these in the fridge just until we're ready to can them because it's gonna be a few minutes before we have enough stuff to run one of our canners. We have our broth and our chicken filled in all of our jars. I have two quart jars here. I'm gonna use a strainer just to strain so we get any of the vegetable bits or anything from going into our jars. And we're gonna put one inch headspace on each one of these jars. Anytime you're canning meat and you raw pack it, whether it's chicken or beef, you do not need to use broth in it because as it cooks in the pressure canner, it'll create its own broth. But if you use cooked meat like ground beef or cooked chicken, you have to add the broth because there's no more excess broth in the meat. I have vinegar in here. I'm going to use distilled vinegar to wipe the rims of these just because the chicken has a little bit of fat in it and the vinegar will help break that down. My ground beef is browned and I took all the fat out and I'm gonna season this ground beef. That was salt. You wanna make sure you're using non-iodized salt when you're canning. The reason is because it can change the colors of your canned goods over time. So this is pepper. I'm gonna mix that in and then we're gonna get this in jars. So for the ground beef, we're gonna fill our pint jars, just like with the chicken, with a one inch head space. I run out, I only have a few wide mouth jars left, so I am using regular mouth as well for this. Chicken and ground beef can at the same time. So I have some chicken in my canner already because it didn't fit in the electric canner. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna fill this up with broth. And I am gonna debubble it. And then we'll get this in the canner. I have two pressure canners. I have this electric pressure canner Easy peasy lemon squeezy, you push the buttons, you don't do anything, it does it all by itself. This is my Presto pressure canner. This is the only canner that I know of that is a pressure canner that you can put on a glass stove and it's very affordable, so I can link both of these. The thing about this one though is you do have to watch it a little bit. There is a vent right here and you can see the steam. Now that it's steaming, I'm gonna set the timer for 10 minutes and I'm gonna pressure can these for, it says, 75 minutes for pints, so that's how long this needs to pressure can for at 11 pounds of pressure at my elevation. You need to check your elevation because because that can dictate how long and what pressure you need to can things for. This one I set for 90 minutes because I have two quarts in there and you always have to pressure can whatever the biggest item is in there or whatever takes the longest to pressure can. I have my sausage cooking here. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to pressure can this. I'm thinking what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try this ground beef out, see how I like it, see how I like the texture before I pressure can this ground sausage. I think what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna set it into little packages and freeze it. I really like having pre-cooked sausage and bacon in my freezer because it's just a convenience food. It makes it a lot easier when I wanna make things like pizza or quiche, like the quiche this morning, that was 
pre-cooked frozen sausage. So we're gonna try both the pressure canning out and then I'm gonna freeze that and then maybe in the future I'll pressure can sausage. But that was the plan today, but I think I'm gonna skip it because I'm running out of jars. Now, let's get going on this rhubarb pie. So we gotta get all this cut up. I did wash it all so it's nice and clean. I got out a lot more rhubarb from the garden than I'll need for today's recipe. So I'm gonna cut it all and I'm gonna freeze whatever we don't need today. When I make rhubarb pie, I like to have different size pieces of chunks in it because then some breaks down and kind of turns into like a sauce and some stays whole and you get a little bit of texture. We're gonna make a custard rhubarb pie today. It's my grandma's recipe and it's my absolute favorite. I got the pie crust rolled out and the top. We're gonna make the filling in here. I'm going to put six cups, maybe a little bit more of rhubarb in our bowl. I think I'm gonna do eight cups. And three eggs, a quarter cup of flour, a cup and a half of sugar, and some salt, and that's the filling. Pies are super easy. I have the oven preheated to 400 degrees. I really like my pies to be really full. I'm gonna take the bottom crust and the top crust, and I'm gonna fold the top crust up underneath the bottom crust. I put the pie on a cookie sheet with some parchment paper because it probably will boil over. And I'm gonna put an egg wash on this. I'm just gonna use the same bowl I made the filling with because we're gonna put some sugar on the top too. This is for Mother's Day, so I'm gonna put an M on here. For Mother's Day. And we'll put a little sugar on the top. I'm putting a piece of foil on the top because this pie, ooh, we had some quiche boil over earlier today. Because this pie is so thick, it's gonna take probably an hour to an hour and a half to cook. And I don't want the crust over cooking or getting burnt before the filling is done. When it's bubbling outside of where I put those little holes, we know that this is done. And so I'm gonna set the timer for 20 minutes then I'm gonna turn the temperature down to 350 and then I'm gonna let it go for an hour and we'll check it then. I decided to make the pumpkin pasta for dinner because one, I was trying to clear out last year's garden harvest, so the pumpkin, and I knew I was gonna be cooking sausage to try to can, even though we decided not to can it. So it just seemed like killing two birds with one stone. Here is the sauce. I am filming what's for dinner, and so this is gonna be in a different video where you'll be able to see the entire recipe. I will have the recipe linked down in the description box though if you are interested in it. This canner is ready to be opened. Oh, it's still. I don't think I'm gonna take these out. Ooh. They're bubbling like crazy. It's very, very hot in here. I don't wanna take them out of this canner because there's still a lot of heat in here. If I take them out, I just think they're still too warm. I would prefer them to slightly cool down more in the canner before I take them out. So we're gonna let them cool for probably 10 minutes or so. I've never double stacked a pressure canner before. This is the first time. I found one of the extra racks at the Goodwill bins, like the Goodwill outlet, and I put it to good use this time. I let them cool for about 10 minutes. They're still boiling, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and take them out of the canner. Oh, I forgot that I had the stew meat in here and it looks different than the ground beef. So 
I'm excited to try that. We'll cook with this stuff together and see how it goes. Like I mentioned, I'm filming a what's for dinner this week video and I don't typically meal plan. <laughs> It's just not my personality, but I like to keep things on hand so I can kind of make whatever I want, whatever I want. And maybe we'll experiment with some of these and see how they do this week. It looks like we got nine pints of chicken, two quarts of chicken, 11 pints of ground beef, and two, and two pints of stew meat. So, oh, and then we got two, four, six, eight, one and a half pints of the jelly, and five half pints of the peach jelly. So talk about productive. I haven't done this much canning since summer. I just got into pressure canning last year, so I haven't done this much canning in the early spring or winter as I've done this year. And I think it's a really good rhythm to can in winter and early spring, beans, broth, meat, these types of things. Start getting your freezer more empty and then canning things like the the garden fresh produce in the summer and fall and it just kind of creates a good rhythm for that so i think that's going to work really great for me and i'm really excited if you guys are scared of pressure canning please don't be i was scared like i said i just started last year and i wish i had started years ago because i wanted to do it for many many years i've been water bath canning for seven years now there's nothing to be afraid of. Just follow the directions. It is something you need to follow the directions, but it's very straightforward. Once you do it, you can do it. You can do it. I will link my pressure canners along with my canning lids, my favorite lids with a discount code down in the description for you guys. If you're wanting to get into canning, they are the best lids and they are the most affordable lids and you can actually get them. They have them in stock, which is really nice. That's not always the case the last two years. So I want to say thank you for hanging out with me today. I greatly appreciate every single one of you. If you guys want to see more of my videos, I'll put some more canning videos up here so you can learn more about canning, kind of more in-depth how-to canning as opposed to today. We're just kind of hanging out and doing it. And then down here, I can put some other garden videos if you want to see what my garden looks like. And I hope that it's just as abundant this year as it was last year. If you guys are new, please consider subscribing. If you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up. And I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye, guys. It looks done. It looks beautiful.